It seems that every time I need Him, my Lord is always there. When no one else seems to have the time, Jesus always cares. I wonder just what I might do if I call. Thank you, Brother Ashley. Alrighty, if you have your Bibles this evening, if you'll turn to the book of Philippians, please. Philippians chapter number 1 tonight. thought I'd share this with you while you're turning there. I preached on the home last night. <clears throat> while on a road trip, an elderly couple stopped at a roadside restaurant for lunch. After finishing their meal, they left the restaurant and resumed their trip. When leaving, the elderly woman unknowingly left her glasses on the table. She didn't miss them until they'd been driving about 20 minutes. By then, to add to the aggravation, they had to travel quite a distance before they could find a place to turn around in order to return to the restaurant and retrieve her glasses. All the way back, the elderly husband became the classic grouchy old man. He fussed and complained and scolded his wife relentlessly during the entire return drive. The more he chided her, the more agitated he became. He just wouldn't let up one minute. To her relief, they finally arrived at the restaurant. As the woman got out of the car and hurried inside to retrieve her glasses, the old geezer yelled to her, While you're in there, you might as well get my hat and the credit card. <laughs> Amen. It's good to be back in the house of the Lord again tonight. I love coming to church. Amen. 
I get encouraged and strengthened by coming to the house of the Lord. Amen. I appreciate the good preaching already tonight. I, I thought about while Miss Emily was singing, I hadn't always been faithful to him, but he's always been faithful to me. Amen. All right, Philippians chapter number 1 tonight, and we'll read just one verse tonight. Verse number 21, preach what I believe the Lord's laid upon my heart for this evening. Paul here writing says, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank You now for the opportunity to be in Your house. Lord, we thank You already for the preaching of the Word of God. Lord, You promised that Your Word wouldn't return unto You void. And God, I stand in great need here now tonight. And I ask You, Lord, that You'd give me that uh, fresh oil from the throne room of God that it takes to make preaching. And Lord, I pray that You'd make it easy for me. And I pray, uh, Lord, that You would stir our hearts tonight. God, I pray that You'd help each and every one of us to examine our lives in the light of God's Word. And God, see if we're where we need to be uh, with You and see if we can get closer to You tonight through the preaching of the Word of God. You help me now, and I'll give You alone the glory, the honor, and the praise. For You alone are worthy. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, I want to preach on this subject tonight with the help of the Lord from this passage of Scripture on a life sentence. A life sentence. Here, Paul sums up his life in one sentence. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Amen. Uh, and our life, I believe, can be likened unto a sentence. Uh, the definition that Webster gives of a sentence is this. A combination of words which is complete or expresses a thought, usually marked at the close by a period. Now, at first glance, a sentence may be complicated and perhaps difficult to comprehend or understand. And uh, let me say that uh, our life is a lot like that. We may not always, uh, at first glance, know what is going on. In fact, I dare say that if you live any length of time, there are going to be things happening in your life that you don't understand. Amen. Uh, hey, just cause we get saved and become Christians. Hey, I got news for you. That bunch of health and wealth, uh, uh, a bunch of devils on television that tell you give them your money and everything will be alright. They ain't evidently ain't never read their Bible. Uh, hey, Christian life, uh, that, just cause you get saved doesn't mean everything's gonna be, uh, a bed of roses. Amen. Hey, the Bible tells us in the world ye shall have tribulation, uh, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Amen. Hey, we need to realize we're not getting ours here. Amen. Ours is yet to come. Hallelujah. So I'm simply saying tonight that, uh, uh, now, now let me say this. I, I'm not an English scholar, okay? You, you'll find that out the longer I preach. I butcher the king's English. Amen. Uh, I tell everybody I am bilingual. I speak English and fluent redneck. Amen. But uh, uh, I do believe that we can take uh, this passage of Scripture tonight, and I want us to apply some of the principles of English and and uh, make an application to our life tonight. Uh, first of all, a sentence has a subject. And this sentence has a subject. For to me to live is Christ. Amen. Hey, the subject of the sentence is Christ. Now let me say this. The uh, subject in any sentence uh, can be expressed or implied. And in the life of a Christian, I believe it is to be both. Amen. Hey, I don't believe there's any such thing as a secret disciple. Amen. Amen. If you're saved, it'll show up on you somewhere. Amen. Hey, and you have to tell others about it. Amen. Amen. Hey, that is the expression. Hey, if you're saved, I believe you ought to open your mouth and tell people about it. Amen. I've used this illustration before, but it's a good one. I was sitting in the barber shop waiting to get my hair cut. There's about a dozen men in there. The two fellows next to me is reading these magazines about UFOs. One of them turned to me and he said, uh, what do you think about you aliens? I said, I am one. 
All conversation in the barber shop stopped. The barber got that guy's hair clean to the scalp. Amen. I said, I'm an alien from the commonwealth of Israel without God in this world having no hope. Amen. I said, but I've been washed. I've been redeemed. Amen. And I took off the preaching in the barber shop. Amen. Some of that crowd wasn't ever coming to church, but they heard it that day. Uh, what, one of them didn't run for the door, and I didn't mind that either. I got my hair cut sooner. Amen. So we're to express the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe you ought to open your mouth and tell people about being a Christian. But then also I believe that our Christian life can be implied. I believe by the way we live, by our actions, by the way people watch us. Hey, I believe, I'm still one of them people still believes Christians ought to be honest. Amen. Amen. And fair in their dealings. Amen. Hey, it's a reflection. I believe you ought to keep your word. Amen. Hey, I remember a day and time when men did business by the handshake and the word of mouth. Amen. Hey, I still believe it ought to be that way with Christian folk today. Amen. Hey, it's a shame and a disgrace that we've got such a bad name. Amen. Hey, I'm saying that you ought not only tell people about it, but you ought to live your life uh, uh, in such a way. You know, the Bible does say, let your light so shine before men that they may see your what? Good words. Hey, I'm so sick and tired of hearing, well, preacher, don't you know God looks on the heart? That's exactly right. God does look on the heart, but the world we live in is looking on our outward appearance. And they're not seeing enough God in us to want what we've got. Amen. So I believe that subject of Christ uh, in our life can be expressed or implied. Amen. Now, let me say, uh, to have self as the subject of one's life sentence is to have narrow horizons, shallow objectives, unsatisfactory achievements, in short, a life that is wasted. Amen. Hey, if you are living for this world only, you are wasting your life. Amen. Hey, uh, I've read articles about people who have clawed and scratched their way to the top and when they get to the top, you know what they find out? After they've achieved everything in life that they wanted to, how they find out that it is hollow and empty. Huh? Hey, there is a void inside of every person uh, that cannot be filled by anything else except the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Hey, I don't care. You know, they asked Rockefeller one time. Uh, they said, uh, how much uh, uh, money do you want? He said, just one more dollar. Yeah. Enough. Even though he's worth millions and millions of dollars, it was never enough. Amen. Hey, why do you think we've got these Hollywood stars that uh, blow their brains out and overdose on drugs? Hey, because they've reached the top of their field and found out that there's nothing there. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Hey, I'm simply saying tonight uh, that a life that is wasted. You know what the Bible said in Mark 8, 35? He said, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. I quoted last night, What is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Hey, I'm simply saying tonight, uh, when we put ourselves as the subject of our life sentence, hey, you'll find out that uh, if you do as you please, you're not pleased with what you do. Amen. Hey, you will never, never, never be happy with self as the center of your life sentence. On the other hand, to have uh, the life with Christ as its subject is a life with wide horizons and worthy aims, and extremely satisfactory accomplishments. Amen. Hey, I don't know you don't believe this, but I, by nature I'm an introvert. I used to, I like to fail speech class because I wouldn't get up in front of people and talk. I've got over that. Amen. <laughs> uh, but I'd have never dreamed that a country boy would travel all over the country, even to other countries, and preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 
Hey, I'm talking about all those things that we strive for. Uh, when we give our life to God, uh, the Bible said that He'll give us even the desires of our heart. Amen. Hey, when we put Him as the center of life, it means satisfaction. Amen. Hey, that's why Paul can say, I- I've learned whatsoever state I'm in there with to be content. Amen. He can do that because he had Christ as the center of his life sentence. Well, I see not only that a sentence has a subject, but I see a second thing tonight. I see that a sentence has a verb. Now, in this sentence, it says, For to me to live. Uh, And that is the verb in this sentence. Now, a verb, by definition, is a part of speech that expresses action, motion, being, suffering, or a request or command. Uh, to do or forbear anything. Now, making application tonight about what we're talking about, uh, we're talking about a sentence has a verb. And let's deal with these uh, definitions of a verb. First of all, I see action. He said in First Corinthians chapter number 10 and verse number 31, Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, uh, do it all to the glory of God, uh, giving none offense, neither to Jews nor to the Gentiles nor to the church of God, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, uh, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Yeah, yeah. Hey, uh, that is the purpose of our life. Amen. Amen the actions of our life, that others might see Christ living in us. Amen. Now, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, you do it all to the glory of God. Amen. I believe you ought to pray about everything in your life. Amen. Uh, I believe you ought to, uh, I believe you ought to involve God in every area of our life. Hey, I tell you where we fail a lot of times as Christians. Uh, we tell God He can have this area and He can have that area. Uh, but we got that one little area in our life. We tell Him that God, no, you don't fool with that. Amen. Hey, but I believe this matter of action, uh, uh that He is to have a uh, full reign over every area of our life. Well, and then that word, verb, uh, that live, uh, uh, verb not only implies, it expresses action, uh, but it expresses motion. And I've already said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Amen. Now, this matter of motion, that means as we move through life, uh, every area of our life is bringing honor and glory to Him. Now, uh, I, I don't know, Brother Brother Jonathan asked a while ago, uh, how many of us work a 40-hour week? I wasn't looking, but evidently there wasn't many that raised their hand. Amen. It means we're either retired or lazy. But, uh, yeah, I believe that, Brother D.C. Uh, whatever you do for a living, uh, let's say you're a carpenter, or uh, Brother Ashley works uh, for a company, uh, whatever your job is, uh, that is not what you've been called to do. That is what you do to make a living. But as a Christian, your job, your primary objective here on earth is to point others to the Lord Jesus Christ. It don't matter what we do for a living, our job, our goal is to point others to Christ. Amen. Hey, and if we're, we're not doing that, hey, we're failing. Amen. Amen. Well, then I, I see that, uh, that word, uh, that action, a verb means not only action and motion, but it, uh, it means being. Being. And I used this verse earlier in the week too, uh, but Paul said, uh, in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Hey, that is the state of our being. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live, where? In the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Hey, let me say this. You cannot... uh, The word Christian doesn't need anything to prop it up. Amen. 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 Christian athlete. Amen. 
Christian race car driver. Christian movie star. Hey, you don't need any of them other words. The word Christian stands alone. Amen. Hey, let me say this. Uh, everybody's claiming to be a Christian in our day and time. Uh, they're so far from... If, 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 if Obama's a Christian, I'm the Pope. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. He wouldn't know God if he walked in the back door. Amen. Yeah. Hey, I'm sick up to here with this crowd uh, that claims to be what we are, and they believe abortion's all right, and adultery's all right, and any other sin. Hey, uh, they drink like a bunch of fish and say they know the Lord. That's a bunch of garbage. The word Christian means to be Christ-like. Amen. Hey, and it don't need anything to, uh, to prop it up. I'm talking about our being. Hey, our very being by the fact that we've been saved and have taken the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. Uh, it means that we are striving uh, to be like Christ. Amen. In every area of our life. We are striving to be like Christ. Hey, and the Holy Spirit will remind you of it too. I don't know about you, but I can't get by with nothing. Huh? Brother Jonathan was talking about trying to get to church. I was in a hurry the other day going somewhere, and this guy cut me off. I did that number. I got on up the road, had to stop get gas. And guess who pulled in? <laughs> he pulled up, rolled his window down. He said, sorry about that. Now, what am I going to do? Say, oh, I'm a Christian. That's all right. <laughs> Are you getting what I'm saying? Hey, Amen. Hey. That word, that sentence has a verb. Amen. That word live, it implies action and motion and being. Uh, but then a verb can imply suffering. Hey, uh, here's what the Bible said in 2 Timothy 3, 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus can, might, what does it say? Shall suffer persecution. Why should we be surprised when... We suffer persecution. Our Lord did. Amen. Hey, and we are promised that if we live godly, hey, you don't have to do anything. Just try to live like a Christian and they'll hate you for it. Amen. Hey, uh, we're seeing evidence of that. Our brother gave you a perfect example tonight. Uh, hey, all, all that one fellow did was stand up for his Christianity. Hey, you know, why is it they preach tolerance to us? They want us to tolerate everything in the world, uh, but they are intolerant of old-fashioned religion. Amen. Yes, Amen. They don't want us to be a Christian. Hey, I'm for separation of church and state. I believe they ought to stay out of the church. Amen. 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 Hey, I'm simply saying, uh, you know, the Bible said in 1 Peter 4, 16, If any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on his behalf. Uh, the disciples went their way rejoicing, counted that they were worthy to suffer shame for him. Amen. Hey, I'm saying we ought to express, uh, we ought to be expect some of this uh, matter of suffering, uh, uh, the fact that we're saved. And then the last, de last definition of that verb, that word verb, is uh, that it implies a, di a direct uh, command. Uh, and let me say that you and I have a direct command. You don't have to pray about telling others about the Lord. We are commanded to do so. Amen. Hey, don't give me that bunch of garbage. Well, I just can't talk to people. That's a lie straight out of pits of hell. You can talk what you want, what you're happy about. Huh? They don't have no trouble talking about bass fishing and deer hunting and Walmart. I had to give the ladies one, amen. Hey, they find the sale on shoes, and before they can get home, every woman in the county knows about it, amen. Hey, and we have a command. He said in Matthew 28, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Uh, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Amen. So a sentence has a verb. A sentence has a subject. 
I see a third thing tonight. A sentence has a predicate. Now, that word predicate means to affirm one thing of another, such as the whiteness of snow. Or in this case, uh, life is Christ. For to me to live is Christ. Uh, and outside of Christ there is no life. Amen. 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 Uh, you know, I, I feel sorry for people that think feel sorry for us. Amen. I had a guy tell me the other day, he said, don't you know you're in bondage? I told him, I said, I'm not the one letting something three inches long control my life. Amen. Yeah, man. I got a boy that's 24 that smokes. I told him when he started uh, years ago, I said, son, you're fixing to start something, but you can't quit. Oh, I can quit any time I want to. No, he can't. It's got a hold on him. Do you understand what I'm saying? Hey, we're not, we're Christians are not in bondage. We've been set free. Amen. Hey, we're not in, uh, we're not under the bondage of Satan anymore. Hey, we're not under the bondage of sin. Amen. Hey, I'm saying we've been free. If the Son shall make you free, uh, you shall be free indeed. Hey, I'm having a whole lot better time. It's an amazing thing to me. How uh, people go out and get drunk off their gourd. Huh? And then they get sick and they go in there and they lay their face right down on the toilet. They wouldn't even touch it with their hands when they was in their right mind. Now they're in there and that cold bowl feels so good. Huh? Man, didn't we have a good time? Huh? Wake up the next morning scratching your head out to here. Huh? I had more fun than I ever did when I was doing that. Don't wake up with a hangover. Amen. Hey, I just began to live. I just began to live when Jesus Christ came in my life. I just began to live. Old things are passed away. I behold a brighter day. My name is written up above. I just began to live. Hey, friend, I, no matter how bad things get down here, we as Christians have hope uh, that one of these days we're getting out of this mess. We're going home to be with the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Hey, you hath he quickened who were dead in trespassing and said, For ye are not dead, for your life is hid with Christ in God. I just started living when I got saved. Amen. Well, I, I wouldn't trade the worst day I've had as a Christian for the best day I had when I was lost. Amen. Well, I see a fourth thing tonight. I see the details of a sentence. Now, Christ puts punctuation marks into our lives to make them more comprehensible and complete. And... At the moment, we may not understand the importance of the punctuation in our life. But when the sentence is complete, then we catch its meaning. Now, let me say that sometimes he puts a comma in our life. Let me, let me just stop right here and say this. I believe God was smart enough to write the Bible just like he meant it to be written. Every comma, every period, every parenthesis, I believe is just like it, just where it's supposed to be. Hey, God not only inspired His Word, but God's smart enough to preserve His Word. And we have that in the English King James Bible. Amen. And i got problems with that crowd uh, that wants to correct our Bible. Amen. Hey, we've even got them in our own movement that say, oh, well, uh, a better translation would be. No, God meant what He said. Amen. Amen. I believe that He was smart enough to put it down just like He meant it to be. Amen. Well, that word comma, you know, He said here, uh, in our uh, in our uh, uh, text, he said, "For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain." Now, a comma indicates a slight change in the direction of a sentence, and in addition to its meaning, or enlargement, or enrichment uh, to its description. Now, uh, the Lord adds to our life uh, that which is new, uh, deeper, and richer by His comma. 
His comma represents His uh, compassion and concern for us. Now, let me give you just a few examples of that. In Genesis chapter number 39 and verse number 3, it said, And his master saw that the Lord was with him, comma, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Hey, Joseph was sold by his brothers into slavery, and we would look at that and say, oh, Man, what in the world is going on? Oh, but you read that passage of Scripture, and every time something drastic happened in Joseph's life, oh, you read these words, And the Lord was with him. He was with him in the, as a slave in Potiphar's house. He was with him in the prison when that wicked woman lied on him. All the time God was preparing him uh, to rule in the palace. God was with him. That's why he put that comma in his life. I, I thought about uh, what it said in the book of First Samuel. Chapter number 3 and verse number 19. And Samuel grew, comma, and the Lord was with him. Amen. And he did let none of his words fall to the ground. I thought about 1 Samuel chapter number 18 and verse number 12. And Saul was afraid of David, comma, because the Lord was with him. Hey, I don't know about you. I don't always enjoy the commas in my life, but I enjoy what comes with it. And the Lord was with him. Amen. I don't know about you, but I'll take that any day. Let me say that the Bible says, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, and then it puts a big comma right there. To them who are called according to His purpose. Well, not only do I see a comma, but then I see a, a semicolon. Here in verse number 23 in our text, it says this, For I am in a strait between two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ. And then there's a semicolon that says this, which is far better. Amen. Hey, Paul was here, but he was longing for another world. Amen. Hey, he was in a strait between two. Amen. Now, that word semicolon indicates a more abrupt and basic change in the direction of the sentence. Now, maybe the Lord puts a semicolon after a line of thought in our life that we would have desired to continue. He is changing the direction of our life. Uh, not to close it or constrain it, but to enlarge its content. Now let me give you one example. My daddy was in evangelism for years and years, just like I am, and he was preaching 50 weeks a year all over the country. And uh, a preacher called him and said, uh, I, I, we're out of a pastor uh, he said, I want to recommend you to this church. He said, uh, my dad told him, he said, I'm not interested, but I do have this Sunday open. I'll come preach for you. So he went down there and he preached for him. In a few weeks, they called him back. And uh, they said, we want you to come back. Uh, and he went and preached again. To be a long, uh, make a long story short, he felt impressed of God to take that church. He canceled all his meetings in evangelism, uh, became the pastor of that church. Three weeks after my dad became the pastor of the Rome Baptist Temple in Rome, Georgia, they found a tumor in my mother's head bigger than a lemon. At that time, Memphis was one of only three places in the world that did that surgery. My mama came over here. She was in surgery for over 12 hours with over six different doctors. And she had to learn to swallow and talk and, and all of that again that we take for granted. She had to learn to do that. And there's no way that my father could have stayed on the road preaching different places week to week to week and took care of my mother. Hey, they kept her over here for months before they ever sent her home. Hey, and, and then when they sent her home, she had to have somebody with her all the time. You say, uh, what is, uh, what are you talking about? Hey, I'm talking about God put a semicolon in his life uh, because he couldn't see the big picture. Uh, but God knew what was going to happen. Amen. Hey, God sees our entire life. And God sometimes changes the direction uh, that we'd like to go uh, because God knows what's coming up. Amen. Well, a semicolon. But then, uh, you know, let me, let me give you another example. He said in Genesis 39, talking about Joseph again, the keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand, talking about Joseph, 
semicolon, because the Lord was with him, and that which he did the Lord made to prosper. Even in the jail, God sent the butler and the baker down there. Amen. And even though they forgot about him for several years, there came a point in time when one of them was in position to tell Pharaoh, I know somebody can interpret dreams. Amen. God was making him ready the whole time to be second only to Pharaoh in Egypt. Well, then I see this matter of parentheses. Now, parentheses in our life, uh, the whole forward movement of a sentence is suspended and something that seems totally irrelevant is inserted there. Have you ever been reading and all of a sudden there's a set of parentheses and you read what's in the parentheses and you think to yourself, now what in the world has that got to do with what I'm reading about? Huh? Hey, sometimes it's like that in our life. Hey, you're going along and everything, uh, everything sees, seems fine. And then some uh, unexplained or unexpected, such as uh, having a, a child lose their mind. That's the best way I can put it. Hey, I, I'm talking about, uh, let me just say this. I used to think that the worst thing that could happen to me is that I could die. But I have lived long enough now to know that there's lots of things worse than dying. And having a child break your heart is one of them. And here you are, you're, you're serving the Lord, you're in the center of God's will, doing the very best that you can to live for God, and all of a sudden it seems like there's this big parentheses in your life, and you have this trouble with a child. Amen. And you wonder, why in the world is this happening to me? Hey, I'm telling you, I believe God puts each and every one of us through different things in our life uh, that we may sympathize with our brother and sister in their time of need. If you had not been there, friend, you can't sympathize. Amen. Hey, this matter of uh, parentheses in our life, uh, I mean, it seems that uh, the interruption and the delay and the difficulty or that the darkness that has entered is causing us uh, such uh, confusion. Hey, it is without explanation or purpose. Let me give you one more example. Several years ago, I, I had a kidney stone. They're wonderful little things. I love them. If you've ever had one, you know what I'm talking about. But I, as a result of that, I had five surgeries in four weeks. And uh, they was pumping me full of phenobarbital and all kinds of other bunch of junk. And as a result of that, I started having what they call anxiety attacks. And if you've ever had them, I, I thought I was losing my low-down mind. And uh, me and God had this conversation more than once. Oh, Lord, here I am trying to serve you. Why are you letting this happen in my life? I, I mean, I'm talking about... I had a guy tell me one time, he said, Preacher, don't you know that's all in your mind? I said, let me beat the devil out of you and see if it's in your mind. I can think of nothing no worse. I mean, they're just awful to have. Uh, but you'd be amazed at how many people that I have run into since that happened in my life that have problems with that in their life. Hey, I'm simply saying that God puts things in our life that we may help others in their time of need. Amen. Within the parentheses, we find meaning in God's perplexing providences in our life. Let me say this. When parentheses come up in your life, it'll make you get closer to God. Amen. Amen. Hey, I wouldn't trade. I wouldn't trade the dark times in my life for the simple reason that I found God in the dark places. Amen. Amen. Well, and then a sentence has a period. <clears throat> now this brings a sentence to its completion. However, it may end with a question mark or an exclamation point. Our life should not be an incomplete sentence. Amen. Uh, it, we should rank steadily onward until the sentence stands complete. Now, Paul said this in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 3 and verse number 2. Ye are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. What are you writing with your life? I have kind of a weird habit. I like reading tombstones. My favorite is this. 
Here lies the body of John Pease. Pease not here, just the pod. Pease went home to be with God. Pretty good, ain't it? Here lies John Brown. He was shot by a stinking Yankee. Read that on a tombstone. I had a preacher friend of mine send me a couple of pictures. Two brothers, John and James Hunt. James Hunt had one finger pointed up and two words. Eternally secure. His twin brother buried right next to him. Had two hands bound in shackles. And these two words, forever alone. One died and went to heaven. One died and went to hell. Do you understand what I'm telling you? I don't want nobody to walk by my casket and wonder where I'm at. Amen. Amen. Hey, I don't want to leave no question in anybody's mind about where I'm going to spend eternity. I went to a funeral not too long ago of a fellow that I knew. Died drunk. The preacher got up and preached him right in heaven. But he had lived as a drunk for 20 years and never been uh, any chastisement of God on his life. And I don't care what that preacher said. You can't live any way you want to and be saved and not be miserable. Our brother said it earlier tonight. The most miserable person in the world is a person that's saved, living outside the will of God. Amen. Amen. Hey, I, I believe you can't. Uh, I'm not saying a Christian can't do wrong, but I'm saying you can't do it and get by with it. Amen. You'll be miserable. Amen. Uh, but the question, I say that to say this, that preacher's preaching to him right in heaven and, and, and talking about uh, how good he was and all this. And I knew the man, knew him well. And I'm sitting back there thinking in my mind, that ain't so. You understand what I'm saying? Questions in my mind. I don't want there to be no question. Hey, uh, I had a, I had a guy die that I knew, and at the funeral home, his mother come up and grabbed me by the lapels, and she said, Preacher, please tell me my boy's in heaven! I couldn't do it, friend. I didn't want to be unkind, but I couldn't look that lady in the eye and say, Yes, ma'am, your boy's in heaven, because I knew he's in hell. You understand what I'm telling you tonight? Hey, I'm saying that our life, our life sentence ought to be uh, not incomplete, but we ought to end it well. Amen. Amen. Let me give you one last thing and I'll be done tonight. I see the description of a sentence. Now, there are as many different kinds of sentences as there are lives. Amen. Let me say this. God doesn't expect you to live your life like me. Amen. Our right, brother said tonight too, God gave us all talents. You're not going to answer for my talent. You're going to answer for your talent. Amen. Hey, turn to the book of 2 Timothy, chapter number 4. Uh, we're talking about all these different kinds of sentences. Hey, like I said, as, as, as many different lives as there are, uh, there are sentences. Now, uh, here in 2 Timothy, chapter number 4, and verse number 6, it says this. Paul here writing to his young t- uh, charge, Timothy, says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Now, that is a simple sentence. Amen. Hey, it's not necessarily short, uh, but without complication. Paul says, For I am now ready to be offering the time of my departure is at hand. Hey, I don't believe Paul was sitting in the jail wringing his hands. Huh? Hey, Paul's saying, Hallelujah, this life's over for me. In a moment, they're going to cut my head off and I'm going to be with the Lord. Amen. Hey, a simple sentence. Amen. Well, then he goes on to say in verse number 7, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Now, here we see a compound sentence. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, a compound sentence has uh, two or more independent clauses. And here we have three. Paul says, first of all, I have fought a good fight. I don't know about you, but the Bible tells us to fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. I heard a guy put it like this. He said, I, he said, I want to hit the devil till I can't hit him no more. Kick him till I can't kick him no, no more. I bite him till all my teeth fall out and then gum him till I die. That's pretty good, ain't it? He said, I have fought a good fight. 
But then he gives us another independent clause. He says, <clears throat> I have finished my course. Now we're living in a day and time when there's a bunch of people not finishing well. I was in Florida several years ago preaching in preaching a revival meeting and a, a pastor called the pastor that I was with in meeting and he told a couple that had retired. She was the church secretary. Her and her husband had retired and they had moved to Florida and he wanted us to go by and visit them. So we went by and knocked on the door one day and we went in, introduced ourselves, started talking to them about the Lord and they said this to us. We've done our bit for God. We're retired. Now I'm sorry, friend, but I didn't know there was no retirement plan on being a Christian. You want me to tell you what their problem was? They did not finish their course well. Amen. Hey, I don't know about you, but I don't want to fall short of the finish line. Hey, I don't want to drop out of the race somewhere along the way. I don't know about you, brother, but I want to run. Hey, I want to set my eye on the goal, and I want to run with patience the race that is set before me. Hey, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Hey, if you get your eyes off the prize, friend, you'll not run well. I have finished my course. But then he said this. Not only I have fought a good fight, I finished my course. But then he said, I have kept the faith. Amen. Hey, Paul finished well. But then look at verse number 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto them, all, but unto all them also that love His appearing. Now, uh, we've seen a simple sentence and a compound sentence, but here is a complex sentence, and it has modifications qualifying the main clause. Now, the main clause of this uh, sentence is this: Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous Judge, shall give me at that day. That is the main clause of this sentence. But then there is a great modification that excites me. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love His appearing. Hey, I'm saying you and I can have the same thing that Paul had, friend. Hey, what is your sentence saying tonight? What are you writing with your life? A sentence should be meaningful and complete when it is finished. It don't matter what punctuation, comma, semicolon, parentheses, modifiers, clauses, independent and dependent. Every detail of a sentence is designed for some purpose. And every detail of our life is designed for some purpose. Hey, God is in the details. When He puts those things in our life, they're not there by accident. They are there for a reason. Hey, and our life should be His handwriting. Amen. Hey, remember, God is in the details of our life. Now, I'm simply asking you tonight, if you had to write a sentence describing your life, what would it be? I believe no greater sentence can be written than that of Paul. For to me to live is Christ. Huh? Huh? If we've got that as the subject of our sentence, then we have it all. And to die is gain. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You for the preaching of the Word of God tonight. Master, I, I do pray, Lord, that You would help us. I, I know, Lord, that we're meeting for revival this week, and I don't believe, Lord, that we'll ever truly have revival apart from ourselves giving ourselves to the Lord. God, I, I pray that You would help us to sell out to God lock, stock, and barrel. Lord, that we'd give ourselves wholly to Thee. I pray, Lord, that You'd have Your will and Your way now. In Jesus' name, amen. You can stand to your feet. The preacher's coming. The Lord spoke to your heart tonight. You need to respond. You come right ahead tonight. What are you writing? Are you writing?